simple, uh, simple columnar. And in particular, I want you to be able to differentiate simple columnar from ciliated pseudostratified columnar. So if you see something like this, uh, you, you see this nice linear, relatively linear arrangement of the nuclei. You see the brush border. Uh, all of this then should be consistent with the, with the simple columnar. Once again, we're looking at an intestinal villus, in this case, in the jejunum. And you also see these cells here. What are these? Yeah, those are the goblet cells. Now, ladies, you will see in, uh, in uh, pseudostratified as well sometimes, but these are mucus secreting cells. There's a kind of relative abundance tends to increase as we move uh, from the esophagus down to the gut. I should say we do, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Can you go back one slide again? <laughs> What was that you called uh, between the two layers of? Is that the sausage? Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's lamina appropriate. Thank you. Um, just bear in mind that virtually all mucosa, mucosa is a fancy word for mucous membranes, have an epithelium, a basement membrane, and a lamina appropriate. They may or may not have some other things too, and we'll talk about those. There may be little wisps of muscle or various other things in there, but those are the primary primary uh, attributes. And of course, if this is an intestinal villus, which it is, this is where, where the intestinal capillaries are going to be to take up the good parts of the breakfast sausage and deliver them to your brain. Uh, also, you have the lymphatic vessels in here and various other structures too. So here, on the right, we have the, uh, oops, we have the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. What you'll notice right off the bat is that you don't have that nice linear arrangement of nuclei. And so under a microscope, depending upon the, well, like almost at any thickness, the cells look to be stratified. It looks like you have a cell layer down here and so. But in reality, they're just curving. And so the plane of the section uh, reflects that when you take a, a linear plane. And the other thing you'll notice is that uh, this is not microvilla. Microvilla out here, these cilia tend to be a little longer, they tend to be a little bushier, um, and uh, they have a different function. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that uh, microvilli are primarily designed to optimize surface area. They're designed in the uh, intestine to optimize um, secretion and uptake. These, these are not. Uh, again, there are only one or two types of cells in which this whole distinction becomes a little cloudy. Uh, these are motile. Motile, they're moving things along. <coughs> here, there's a question. here we have another example of one of those, uh, those uh, epithelial, epithelium do not fit into the categories we mentioned before. This is transitional epithelium. Now, we had to guess, so let's say we didn't have a transition of epithelium category, we just had to use our traditional <laughs> classification to identify this. How would you describe this epithelium? What does it look most like? It gives the histology students a fit. Uh, you say pseudo I don't see, what, 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 when I see pseudo I don't look for those silly up there, I don't really see those. Squamous? Well, so I guess part of our problem is we're not even sure how <laughs> the depth of the epithelium. So we have these cells up here. But the epithelium actually includes all of this. Mm. That's all epithelium there. And so uh, most students call that, or would think that's pseudo, I'm sorry, uh, uh, stratified squamous. Because when it's stratified squamous, uh, it's, it, it's sort of on its head. Sometimes you have this appearance, sometimes you don't. But what tends to happen, this is relaxed. Um, that whole complex here becomes this. And so when it's stretched, and so it's very hard to identify. That looks more like, well, I don't know what, what you would call that. Uh, but as it stretches out, this is the appearance that it has under the scope. Characteristic of the bladder and designed to accommodate the, um, designed to accommodate the special mechanical conditions there. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about glandular epithelium. I just want you to know that right now we're talking about epithelia. So we're talking about exocrine glands. Exocrine glands are glands that secrete their product onto the surface 
of the skin rolled into a uh, large into a large luminal system, such as the digestive tract, or in some cases the, the respiratory tract. It, usually, we're talking about the digestive tract. And so the only thing I would ask is that you be familiar with the, the general terminology that is used to describe exocrine, exocrine glands. In general, the glands can be simple or, um, but in the case of a simple, a simple gland here, you can see that the gland simply has one little tube here. It can be branched. If there are multiple levels of branching, the gland is called compound. If the shape of the gland is not tubular, such as, as you see on the left, if it has a more ovoid shape or whatever, um, that, that, I guess I, I never really cared for this terminology, but then this is sometimes called acinar or alveolar. Uh, we have an example down here. This would be a compound alveolar down here. Um, so I think the key things to keep in mind are notice whether the gland, the exocrine gland, is simple or branched. There can be more than one level of branching. If there's more than one level of branching, it's called compound. Now, traditionally, uh, there's a distinction between acinar and alveolar. I don't want to get into that. I'll put a little illustration here to describe the, the, the actual um, traditional distinction. So you'll note in the, this is acinar, this is alveolar, acinar, alveolar. Here we have a straight lumen, here we have a little molar area at the bottom. So the difference is in the acinar, the lumen does not, the lumen size does not change, but the cells enlarge. In the alveolar, the cells remain the same size, and the bottom of the gland enlarges. That's the traditional distinction. But uh, this, what I've noticed in the literature, especially the clinical literature, this distinction is no longer observed. Okay. So I guess right. the point I'm making is that you will see these terms used interchangeably. Uh, here we have a typical uh, tubular gastric gland. You can see that it's branched here. So it's kind of interesting when we talk about these glands. Don't assume that these are uh, these are simple cuboidal cells surrounding a single lumen. Uh, they can have rather remarkable shapes. Uh, a gland. There are glands in the stomach. There are glands in the intestine. And you know, in both cases, they have this branched tubular conformation. And a variety of cells we'll talk about later subserved a number of functions. Um, in, the, in the stomach, the glands are called pits. In the intestine, they're called crypts. Kind of like you think of this classroom. <laughs> now, we looked at the, the morphology of these epithelial glands. Um, there is also a somewhat dated terminology to describe the mechanism by which these epithelial glands secrete their product. And you can see the three large or the three general classes here, merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine. The traditional distinction is that merocrine cells, merocrine secretory cells, secrete by simple exocytosis, which you've studied in the physiology class. Apocrine cells, such as those of the axillary region, uh, secrete by bleeding off or bedding off a portion of the cell, and that portion, that apical portion of the cell, then is the secretory product. Holocrine cells are the most inspiring of all. You want to follow the example of the holocrine cell. Because the holocrine cell, in pursuit of its purpose in life, is its own. The act of secretion requires cellular necrosis. The cell dies and just gives, yields forth its, its contents to the surroundings. Sebaceous glands are typically holocrine. 
spoiled lands. The problem is that uh, we're finding there's, there's not such a clear distinction between Meriquin and Apocrine. The, the, the uh, traditional distinction in the textbooks is not holding up, but for simplicity, we will retain the terminology. Sorry, any questions about any other discussion about eating? Remind me of what was in the zoo? No. That was someone else who should be saying it. Right, so let's move it. Let's turn our attention away from epithelium and, and talk about uh, connective tissue. Now remember, there are four general types of tissue. We talked about epithelium. There's also muscle and nervous tissue. And then there's this, this catch-all category called connective tissue. So what we're really going to do is just talk about some of the, the terminology used to characterize connective tissue. Um, first, larger, first point, and by the way, I think the first two slides pretty much say the same thing, and we've touched on this before. Connective tissue consists of cells embedded in a matrix. Cells embedded in a matrix. Remember, epithelium doesn't have them. There, there is no appreciable matrix in an epithelium. Yeah. Yeah. So connective tissue uh, consists of these cells of various types. We've already named some of them. Surrounded by a matrix. The matrix can be solid, semi-solid, or fluid. Moreover, in virtually all cases, that matrix contains fibers. So a one dated but sometimes observed um, <coughs> terminology that you will encounter is that connective tissue consists of cells and matrix. The matrix consists of two parts, ground substance, ground substance, and fibers. So again, that's an older, somewhat dated terminology, but I just want to make sure you, you are prepared for this if you see it. So again, connective tissue, three parts, cells, ground, subst ground substance, and fibers. But what I see, again, in most of the literature is that there is no distinction between ground substance and matrix anymore. The terms are pretty much used interchangeably. But whether you wish to observe that distinction or not, you should be aware that um, the matrix of virtually all connective tissues includes a large component of fibers. One of the key uh, differences that uh, differentiate, one of the key characteristics that differentiates the various types of connective tissue is the ratio of cells to matrix. So some types of connective tissue have a high uh, matrix to cell ratio, others have a much lower uh, ratio. I mentioned earlier the connective tissue traditionally is considered either binding or supportive. The binding connective tissue would include things such as tendons and ligaments. Supportive connective tissue would include tissues such as or uh, you know, tissues such as a, a bone, cartilage, blood, and that sort of thing. In the in your study, you will also encounter the term the delightfully pretentious term connective tissue proper. Connective tissue proper. And by connective tissue proper, all, all we mean is that is a, uh, a very basic rudimentary type of connective tissue that includes cells and a, and a definable, observable, tangible matrix. For example, blood. What's the matrix of blood? What are the are there different types? It gets a little fuzzy and hazy there. Um, but connective tissue proper is uh, such as the hypodermis or the dermis. These would be, these would be exactly the, the uh, yeah. both examples of connective tissue proper, where you have different types of cells embedded within a very clear matrix. Um, you would often see reference to connective tissue being described as loose or dense. The terms loose or dense uh, refer primarily to the arrangement and abundance of fibers. <coughs> Fibers. So it's a loose connective tissue. It just means that there are fewer fibers. We often we also differentiate um, connective tissues with fibers termed either uh, regular or irregular. 
Once again, the terms of regular and irregular refer to the fibers. If the fibers are arranged in parallel, they're termed regular. If they're sort of desultorily arranged or arranged at uh, various angles to each other, that is called irregular. So you can see the possible combinations. We can have dense regular or dense irregular connective tissue, for example. And then, again, that's the distinction. Connective tissue proper has, has a very clear observable uh, number of cells embedded in a matrix. Whereas if we get into tissues like uh, uh, the, the blood and the lymph, that uh, it becomes more difficult to differentiate this. I've indicated that connective tissue contains, a, in many cases, a high, uh, high concentration of fibers. Uh, those fibers are typically secreted by cells called fibroblasts. Remember in our, in our examination of bone, we talked about osteoclasts and osteoblasts. What do the osteoblasts do? Yeah, they deposit the matrix. And the osteoclasts, all right, so that, those suffixes then tell you what those cells do. Same thing here. Most, in most cases, when you see the suffix blast, that means that that cell is making something. It's producing or making something, just like an osteoblast is, make, is making the matrix of the, the bone. So a fibroblast, what is it making? It is secreting fibers, usually collagen fibers. You, the collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. These fibroblasts are necessary for that. There's an earlier type of cell, a very logically earlier type of cell called a fibrocyte, um, but that's, uh, that's a different type of cell. Uh, the fibroblasts are, again, abundant in a variety of, 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 of connective tissue types. They don't, they, um, they secrete, I guess a better way of saying this is that a fibroblast is uh, probably the most abundant cell in all types of connective tissue, and its main job is to secrete the matrix, to, to produce the matrix of connective tissue properly. And we've already seen that a large component of that connective tissue matrix, independent of the ground substance, is the, is the, are the fibers. Um, now, depending upon the, the particular type of connective tissue, in addition to the cells and the, and the fibers, I'm sorry, in addition to the fibroblasts and the fibers, you can have a variety of other cells too. You can have uh, macrophages, you can have um, leukocytes and differentiated leukocytes. Basically, a number of these cells, a number of these leukocytes, when they leave the blood, they differentiate into other types of cells, such as mast cells and plasma cells, for example. But in the illustrations here, you can see uh, this would be an example of um, a connective tissue that has a high concentration of fibers, um, and these are more or less regularly arranged. They have a sort of wavy appearance there. But they're relatively few observable cells, so this would be characteristic of dense, regular connective tissue. Tendons and ligaments would both be of that type. So, just mentioned here a couple of the types of cells you're likely to encounter in connective tissue. Proper macrophages in connective tissue can be fixed or they can be motile. Um, if they're motile, they're moving all over the place. If they're fixed like copper cells in the liver, they're sort of, they're sort of looking like a moor yield or some predator at one location and waiting to gobble up whatever goes by them. Uh, mast cells, of course, you're going to be dealing as a PA, you're going to be dealing a lot with the effects of mast cells. Mast cells, most importantly to you, mediate a number of uh, autoimmune and immunological responses. So, uh, anaphylaxis, you see there, or as I've indicated, autoimmune disorders or anything from uh, osteoarthritis or other types of uh, autoimmune uh, diseases are thought to be associated, at least to, to some extent, with the activity of mast cells. Uh, they also release histamine. We talked about uh, histamine. Uh, well, histamine is, serves a variety of functions in the body. It's, a, it's everything from a, a neurotransmitter to a, to a hormone. Uh, but it also uh, tends to promote uh, in the connective tissue, an inflammatory response when it's begin that component. Mast cells are not all bad. They uh, are very important, it is thought, in uh, the healing process, wound healing in particular. 
we've talked about uh, heparin. What was heparin? Yes, yeah, so it, it basically is an anticoagulant, uh, has anti anticoagulant properties. I was talking to the fellow the other day about uh, his having to change medications. They, you're going to find as a PA that uh, some patients can, can only withstand certain types of these blood thinning medications, and you have to be very careful uh, in, with respect to the dosage and the type. So we talked a little bit about the fibers. We said the most abundant type of fiber is the collagen fiber. Uh, there may also be present in the uh, connective tissue elastic fibers. We talked, for example, about elastic cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. We said that they differentiate primarily the types of fibers present. Cartilage is, of course, a type of connective tissue. Uh, reticular fibers are all over the place, too. Reticular fibers are especially abundant in the capsules or connective tissue that uh, lines organs. So, for example, the spleen, uh, uh, the adrenal gland, uh, would be uh, encased by connective tissue that has a high concentration of reticular fibers. Reticular just means branching, definitely, like a tree. most of this. We talk, well, we've talked about gags, and we've talked about the hydration, and so on. Another uh, type of connective tissue, of course, is adipose tissue. We're looking at some illustrations of adipose tissue here. Uh, depending on a variety of factors and the type of adipose tissue we're discussing, uh, there may be variable amounts of matrix. But you can see in adipose tissue, the cells are quite large. Uh, and so as connective tissue goes, you have a fairly high cell to matrix ratio. There are two classes of adipose tissue. I'm not sure if this, I think, I, yeah, two, two uh, general forms of adipose tissue. We have uh, unilocular or white fat and multilocular or brown fat. Of course, you all know that because you are uh, devotees of the brown fat revolution, I'm sure. <coughs> um, white fat is the more abundant of the two. We have white fat, um, depending upon our, depending on whether we're males or females. I have to be careful how I say all these things nowadays. Uh, whether we're males or females, our fat is deposited in different locations. But most all of us have a fairly healthy amount of fat uh, under our skin, in what's called the hypodermis. Uh, but depending upon a variety of factors, we also have um, white fat encasing, for example, the heart, uh, protecting the liver and kidneys. Um, so the white fat in the body serves a number of functions. It is, uh, it is a metabolic tissue. It is an energy storage tissue. It's much more efficient than, for example, uh, glycogen at storing, storing tissue. I'm uh, sorry, uh, storing energy. Um, a lot of lipids, of course, uh, stuffed into there. Uh, in, in histological preparation, what typically happens is the, the tissue is exposed to an organic solvent that just dissolves and washes out all of the lipids and thus in virtually all histological specimens, histological preparations of white fat, this is what you see. All you see is what's left of the cell membrane because everything in the interior is gone. There's not much in the interior but adipocyte anyway. It's just, it's just basically lipid and it, uh, it disappears. So for those of you who are, who are uh, pursuing the brown fat revolution, what can you tell me about brown fat? Any devotees? No idea. What can you tell me? You're, you're, I mean, uh, I've, I've read about it before. Yeah. Like, because it burns more calories than like, white fat. <coughs> I've heard about it is that like, apparently like, you can change the amount of brown fat you have in your body by like, adapting to like, well, not that specifically. But that's what he said. Apparently it changes like you can adapt to like cold. So like I've read Sounds like a very desirable lifestyle to me. <laughs> um, well, you're exactly right. The idea uh, behind, well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about brown fat. Uh, brown fat, first of all, is present in all of us. Uh, we have much more of it as neonates than we do as adults. And you can see the relative, uh, the typical locations of brown fat in the baby. It's sometimes called baby fat. Mm. 
And you'll notice that it's basically along, the, it's in the neck here, it's on the, on the uh, shoulders, and then down a little bit down the spinal column. And one thing that it is, it's highly thermogenic, highly thermogenic, because metabolically it undergoes decoupled mitochondrial respiration. By that I mean it's, it's oxidative phosphor. So it's like they go out the parking lot and uh, starting your car up and just lowering the gas, or putting the uh, accelerator all the way down, and not putting anything in the gear. So just sitting there burning, burning fuel. That, to some extent, is what the brown fat does. It goes, it undergoes uh, decoupled oxidative phosphorylation, so no real work is performed other than generating heat. All right. So if this is a specialized tissue in a baby that generates heat in those locations, can you think of any adaptive value to them? Are there any parts of your body that are especially sensitive to thermal changes? Nobody thinks of it. Can think of it. A region of the body that's particularly vulnerable to dramatic changes in temperature. I can I can put well okay the, I could you're gonna lose you're gonna have problems with another tissue before you'll have problems with those. I think go ahead and I can put your head in the freezer. <laughs> um, well, we'll have a we'll have a little allegory about the lungs a little later when we get to the respiratory system. But so you probably know that if body temperature becomes too high or too low, you'll lose consciousness, right? Um, the and more importantly, if that condition persists for a long period of time, that damage because the brain and the nervous system has limited capacity for regeneration, that can be irreversible. So my point here is that the, the general evolutionary biological explanation for brown fat in the neonate is that it's up here protecting the blood vessels, the carotids, right, making sure that the blood going to the brain is at sufficiently high temperature. Everything. These neonates uh, don't have all the sophisticated developed systems that you have as an adult. They haven't developed yet. And it probably is protected, at least the usual explanation is protected of the spinal cord in this region too. But of course, if you fully understand the advantages of the brown fat revolution, you understand, as, as was pointed out, that if you, can, um, if you can get more brown fat in your body than is currently available, what would be the advantage? Then you'll burn more calories. You'll burn a whole lot more calories because this stuff is very interesting going up in the car parking lot and stepping on the accelerator. So I'll leave it to you whether you want to decide uh, to join the brown fat revolution. He says, I can't read it here. He's a, he's a plastic surgeon, buddy. But he wants to build high quality brown fat. You can do it. You can do it. To do it behaviorally. And he's he's got his fist, fists uh, closed, there, so he's angry. And I think maybe he's got some lifting straps on there, so he's ready to go. Yes, ma'am. So, change brown fat in your body? I think you would argue uh, as much. Yeah. I don't think so. Buy his book first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those would, would be, to give you a physiologically correct answer, those would be independent processes. You can certainly change the volume of white fat, but that would be unrelated to the, yeah. Now, there, has, there has been research recently to suggest that we have, as adults, dispersed through our bodies much more brown fat than was previously believed, but I'm not sure that we know what it's doing, and I'm not sure, despite the uh, unassailable integrity of this gentleman and his product, uh, that there's a whole lot of evidence to suggest that we can really modify the volume of brown fat. In any case, submitted for your consideration. Um, brown fat, again, is unilocular because of those large cells. Brown fat cells are smaller and called multilocular. And then we can see a couple of a couple of examples of these uh, fixed specimens. I think you just get husks of the, the cell there. Uh, I, did, I did say something about the relative deposition in males and females. Uh, it's, it's sometimes called the android and the gynecoid fat deposition pattern. Where do men keep most of their uh, excess fat? Yeah, in the, in the belly there, no handles or whatever. Uh, and where do women keep theirs? Hips. Called the gynecoid or pear-shaped, 
hips and legs, which is which is which is uh, superior physiologically, which is the better strategy? <laughs> Yeah, the gamma cord is, is has uh, has advantages because uh, uh, the fat deposited around the GI tract ends up at a much higher rate in the uh, blood. So I see better. The in other words, the males it is thought are more prone to atherosclerotic plaque deposition and and problems associated with uh, a higher concentration of of uh, of lipoproteins of various types in the blood. One thing I keep in mind here too is that we're also learning, this is a somewhat dated article, but whether there's been all kinds of research recently. Uh, I think the last count that we found almost a hundred different hormones that are released from fat. So uh, it, adipose tissue is not just energy storage, it seems to play a number of endocrine, have a, a role in a number of endocrine functions. If you had to guess, you probably know some of these hormones. Uh, the relative volume of fat tissue would probably play a role in regulating what aspect of your behavior do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leptin, for example, is one of these first hormones that was discovered. Uh, it seems to play a role in appetite regulation. Okay. Um, so there are a few other tissues that, uh, with which you should be familiar. This is another one that I would uh, ask you to be able to recognize. Uh, uh, areolar tissue. The, the term areolar also means loose, irregular. So, somebody tell me what uh, what those terms mean: loose and irregular. Irregular would be what? Right, so the fibers in that connective tissue would not be in a parallel arrangement; they would be uh, variously and decimally arranged. Exactly right. If it's loose, that's generally the term, that's the, the, the uh, connective tissue term to do, suggest that there's not a lot of fibers, that the, the uh, abund relative abundance is not great. So if you look at this illustration, <clears throat> this is all the tissue here, otherwise known as loose, irregular connective tissue. And you can see we have fibers in here. These would be the collagen fibers here. These would be the elastin fibers here. We have random placement of fat cells. We have capillaries because all, all of this tissue is going to be uh, sufficiently vascularized. I should have mentioned, of course, that adipose tissue is heavily vascularized for reasons that might be self-evident to you. You can see some macrophages up there. You can see some plasma cells. You can see reticular fibers. So it's just a hodgepodge of all these things we've been talking about, but in a rather loose and uh, uh, haphazard sort of arrangement. So that's all the other tissue. All the other tissue would be present, for example, in the hypodermis, the, the tissue underlying the, the integument of the dermis. And then oftentimes, all the other tissue is present in casing uh, larger tissues. So for example, the fat tissue around the kidneys and the liver might gradually turn into, uh, might gradually become Tissue. Uh, the reticular tissue just means that the tissue has a high concentration of reticular fibers. We indicated previously that the most, uh, most common examples of reticular tissue are the capsules that encase organs such as the spleen and the adrenal gland. But the reticular tissue just refers to the, the, re the reticular fibers that you see in that tissue. Um, here we have an example of dense regular connective tissue, dense regular connective tissue. Notice the highly parallel organization of the fibers. This is a tendon. Uh, the dense, of course, implies that, there, that the fibers are high abundance. In fact, in, most, in many cases, you have a hard time even finding the cells in here. Um, and then there can be, it's usually a collagen. There's usually, the fiber type is predominantly collagen, but certain types of dense regular connective tissue have a relatively high concentration of elastic fibers. Uh, vocal cords, for example, have a lot of, have a high concentration of elastin. The irregular dense connective tissue <laughs> will come up primarily in our discussion of the skin. We'll find uh, 
for example, the dermis, a portion, a full one, one region of the dermis uh, consists of irregular dense connective tissue. Why do you say ligaments, uh, fibers and ligaments have a regular arrangement? Because they're parallel. It's kind of like the desks in here. So fibers can be arranged <laughs> parallel to one another, or they can be. So for example, uh, if a tissue needs to withstand torsion or stress pulling from multiple angles, then that tissue is more likely to have an irregular arrangement. If the stress is along a single trajectory, it's more likely to be regular. But yeah, I get that. I'm just kind of was confused as to why it says although, even though you have it. Or you see all of them on this one? Yeah. And what? As if it was an exception. Ligaments and tendons. Oh, because we're talking a regular dense connective tissue. Let me see. Oh, I don't. Know. <laughs> I'm sure there was a very intelligent reason. I can't think. I can't think of the reason. Um, now these would all have uh, ligaments and tendons would have a regular arrangement. I'll reflect upon that. So you can see the regular dense here, very tight arrangement. <clears throat> this is irregular dense here. These little wisps of connective tissue going in different directions. Again, we'll, we'll see that in the skin. A lot of the joint capsules, um, remember, we previously saw an illustration of joint capsules. We said there's an interior and an exterior compartment. The exterior compartment generally consists of ligamentous tissue. Uh, sometimes that ligamentous tissue uh, has a more irregular arrangement. Please be sure you understand that all of these terms are just descriptive. It's not as if uh, we can say this is number 33, put it in the number 33 box, this is 14, put it in the number 14 box. These are just very loose descriptions of, of uh, the arrangement of cells and fibers in the tissue. We're going to talk about cartilage. I think, you, I think you're familiar with the distinction between the high